Right guys, today we're going to look at uh, gradients, riding up hills, climbing. We're going to look at the science, the high science behind that. In other words, what do we know about how to attack hills from a science perspective? I think you're going to find this interesting. Everyone knows about riding on the flat, but hardly anyone knows the right strategy to ride hills. And I'm going to crack that code for you here. So the first thing to do is just to quickly understand how your energy is used on hills. If that's your gradient of the hill, then the amount of energy you're using to combat gravity rises exponentially as the hill gets steeper. And although some small amount, around 10%, is also expended in drivetrain losses, at low gradients, like 0 to 1%, 70 to 80% of the energy is actually expended fighting against air. So that's where your watts over CDA, CDA being frontal area times by drag, calculation is important. And here, like for example, in 10% gradient, 90% of your energy is expended fighting against gravity. So that's where your watts per kilogram comes in. There is a tipping point where 50% of the energy is used to combat air resistance and 50% against gravity. And believe it or not, it's around a 2% grade. Around 2% grade, you're fighting gravity and air resistance about 50-50 depending on your speed. Okay, now how do we work out how to ride up a hill in the most basic way? What is the power? What is the speed? How should we calculate in a race how to ride up a hill? Well, let's take a infinite hill, which is effectively a mountain where the slope just goes on and on. How are you going to attack, how are you going to attack that slope? Well, if we break it down, by uh, the power needed to go up the slope, you can actually convert what you're able to do into your optimum strategy for a ride where the ride is an infinite hill. And let's take an uh, example of an infinite hill. Well, I say infinite. Let's pick a 17 kilometer ride up a 3% gradient. And I'm not just making that stat up here. That's actually the Tour, Tour de France 2016, stage 18. Stage 18 was 17 kilometer time trial uphill with the average gradient being 3%. Now, if we chart out the speed that we get riding up certain gradients, it will look something like this. Um, for example, if you put out 300 watts, then you're going to be going a certain speed very fast at a low gradient, i.e. 0%, and you'll be going a very modest speed at 10%. And we can actually put some figures on this. If you go to the website, Computational Cyclist, that's Steve Grimble's site, grimble.com, um, and you put in your own figures, for example, weight, CDA, and your power, then it'll tell you for each gradient what speed you're going to go. But let's take a hypothetical rider, 75 kilograms, 1.8 meters tall, um, 75, 75 kilograms being 165 pounds, and map that cyclist onto these gradients where we're particularly interested in 3% in this race. So what we're going to find that at um, 300 watts, the cyclist is going to be going up that hill around 27 kph. Now, let's take a cyclist's um, power curve. Probably know the power curve from Power Agent or Strava power curve. Once you've done a few rides, you can compute your power curve, providing you're using a power meter. So the, the cyclist power curve can be look something like this. So 300 watts, this cyclist, let's say they're a beginner, they can hold that for five minutes, but they can hold 250 watts for 20 minutes. So that's their FTP, 20 minute FTP or CP20. But they can hold 240 watts, for example, for let's say 45 minutes. Okay, why am I telling you this? Well, why am I telling you this is because if you wanted to go up that hill at 27 kph at 300 watts, the cyclist is going to run out of energy after five minutes. And unfortunately, 27 kph over 17k is 38 minutes. So <laughs> the cyclist is not going to manage to ride up that hill at 300 watts for 38 minutes when they can only do five minutes at 300 watts. So maybe 20, 250 watts would do it. 250 watts will get you a speed 
of 24 kph. The 24 kph up that hill of 17 kp kilometers will take exactly 43 minutes. Now 43 minutes at 250 watts is not going to do it because he can only manage 250 watts for 20 minutes. Okay, what about just coming down a fraction to, to 40 watts then? Well, this might be about right. 240 watts gets you 23 kph, and it takes 44 minutes. And sure enough, the cyclist can do 45 minutes in training at 240 watts. So from this calculation that we've extracted, and I'll show you the graph here overlaid, we can work out the optimum strategy for a long hill climb for that cyclist is basically 240 240 watts. Now the figure is going to be different for you, but this is how to work out where your best pacing strategy is for that hill. Now, what if the hill is not just a mountainous slope which goes on forever? What if the grade varies? Okay, it's more complicated, but this is where a slightly different pacing strategy comes in. Now you can break the hill down into various segments, but I'll show you how to work out one particular segment. So let's take one hypothetical segment where the hill goes up, it reaches a peak, and then comes down to the same grade. And let's say that grade is plus 5% up, and making it simple, minus 5% coming down. And again, making it simple, let's keep that as one kilometer up and one kilometer down. How are we going to attack that hill? Well, the simplest thing to do is for the rider to ride at his or her FTP which we just said hypothetically for this 75 kilogram 168 uh, 165 pound cyclist was 250 remember so 250 watts going up 250 watts going down now it just so happens that if you go up at 250 watts your speed is going to be your speed is going to be 18 kph up that hill and your speed coming down is going to be 58 kph coming down and that in time over one kilometer is 3.4 minutes going up and 1.0 minutes coming down. Okay, 4.4 minutes, fine, simple you say. However, pacing is important on a hill because the rider, even though he's kept constant watts, has spent an inordinate amount of time, 3.4 times as long, going up what is in effect the same distance because of the grade. The grade or the gradient has slowed the cyclist down to 18 kph. He's spending an inordinate amount of time going uphill. So an alternative strategy is to increase your power for the uphill stretch. Now the problem is you can't increase your power indefinitely without running out of energy. But we already said the rider could maintain 300 watts for roughly five minutes and recover on the downhill. So what if the cyclist does that then? Cyclist goes up at 300 watts and effectively rests somewhat on the way down at 200 watts. So what that does is it increases the uphill speed um, from 18 kph to something around 20.5 kph. And the downhill speed, surprisingly, because of the effect of wind resistance pushing against you so hard and the lack of gravity, even at 200 watts, the cyclist pretty much attains um, 57 kph on the way down. And what that means in terms of time over that same one kilometer is that the cyclist takes 2.9 minutes going uphill with this adaptive pacing strategy and uh, 1.06 minutes, 1.06 minutes coming down. In other words, the cyclist needs 3.96 minutes with the adopted pacing strategy and 4.4 minus 3.96 is 0.44 of a minute which is basically 26 seconds so by adapting your pacing increasing your power on the upslope and decreasing the power on the downslope you can save a significant amount of time in a relatively short event um, effectively that is free speed covering on the way down so when the road levels out you should be able to get back to your FTP pace now 
the exact amount of increase, as in increase beyond your FTP, and the exact amount of decrease is very personal. It depends on your ability to burn extra matches and recover, as they say in cycling. But just as a rough rule of thumb, you can increase your wattage by 5% for every 1% increase in grade, and vice versa, decrease it by 5% for every 1%. So on a 5% grade, 5 times 5, you can increase your wattage by 25%. But that's assuming a short effort. It doesn't work with very long efforts. With extremely long efforts, which are, let's say, approaching 20 minutes or beyond, you're going to have to follow a constant pacing strategy, which I showed you before. Let's have a look at the effect of weight now, and the way to do this is to hold speed steady. So let's look at the effect of weight on going uphill at 20 kph. So what we want to know is how much power does it take for the cyclist to go uphill at 20 kph. Well, if you're not on a hill at all, it only takes about 50 watts for a 75 kilogram cyclist to go along on the flat. But by the time you get to 3%, it takes 200 watts to go uphill at 3%. At 7% takes around 420 watts to go uphill at 20 kph. And at 10% it takes 520 or more watts to go uphill, 520 watts. But here's the interesting thing. A heavier rider, say 85 kilos or 95 kilos, it takes a disproportionately greater power to go uphill at that same speed. And a lighter rider, it takes a disproportionately less power to go up speed to go uphill at that speed, such that this difference here is mag magnified. Actually, the difference between a heavy and light rider on zero percent is only around ten watts. From a the difference between a ninety-five kilogram rider and a sixty-five kilogram rider, whereas at three percent, the difference between top and bottom, just based on weight difference. Aerodynamics staying the same is 60 watts. And at 7%, the difference between top and bottom is 120 watts. And at 10%, it's 180 watts, the difference. In other words, it's like having two riders. The difference between propelling a 65 kilogram and a 95 kilogram rider uphill. And that tells you the, the great importance of weight when going uphill. The effective weight is minimal at zero, but is very significant at higher gradients. Okay, now let's consider position. Position is probably the, one of the most uh, regular questions I get asked. So what position should you ride? Now you can ride on the hoods and that would be like your typical position, but you can also sit up on a hill. It's a very common thing to sit up on the hill. And if you sit up, you usually gain around about 10% uh, in power. So a rider that's riding at 250 watts, 250 watts on the hoods, can typically ride at 275 sitting up on the bars and that's because of the more vertical position you get more air in the lungs respiration is generally easy but a more optimal aerodynamic position is obviously a time trial position time trial position you might lose around about five percent going from let's say if a rider was 250 at their ftp going to around 240 in that time trial position but you gain on the aerodynamics i use cda is lower around 0.25 cda compared to 0.32 on the hoods for example and there's another position as well of course and that's standing up standing up is a position it's not a complete change of strategy standing up gives you extra power and if you watch your power meter while you're standing up you'll see that you can gain about well 25 percent for a short period but it is a short period it's like pressing the turbo button on a on a boost where you where you're draining your energy so you can't use the standing position indefinitely Standing position comes at a cost, and the cost is in aerodynamics. It's the least aerodynamic position. And the CDA, if you want to work it out, is typically around 0.6 for a standing position. So if we add all these together, we can do something quite clever, which is map the gradient against the aero versus weight penalty. Basically, we can look at the speed achieved for each position. So if this was the speed of the TT position, this would be the speed of riding on the hoods. And contrary to that, this would be the speed 
of standing up. Now remember, TT, I'm modeling here, typical TT aero with a typical TT gain in power. So the exact crossover is going to vary. So at the, at the bottom here, this is gradient. This is the percentage of the hill. Okay. However, this modeling, which can be done for you as an individual, but if you can't be bothered to do that, you'll still get the take home message from this chart here. What we can conclude from this is something very interesting. It's where's the, where's the optimum positional strategy for each gradient. And at the extremes, it's fairly simple. In the extremes, at 0, 1, and 2 gradient, the optimum position, even going uphill at 2, is normally a time trial position. And at the extremes, the other way, 7, 8, 9, and 9 plus, anything very steep, the optimum, if you can maintain it, is actually standing. If you can't maintain it, it's on the bars sitting up with a maximum power that you can maintain. So that's standing. So where does that leave that middle ground? Well, that middle ground is where we have a crossover. There is a slight advantage for either TT or hoods there. And there is a slight advantage for standing or um, on top of the on top of the bars there. And really there's no no preference for that gradient of four. Okay, but we can also do the same for equipment because it's the same trade-off between weight and aero. So have a look at this. Let's take wheels as an example. And within the question of wheels, so should we use a climbing wheel set, which typically are really light, front and back combined, one kilo, and they're aerodynamic to a certain extent, giving a CDA of about 0 0.03? Or should we use a TT aero pure aero, for example, disc wheel, tri-spoke carbon front, which is typically around 1.5 kg, 500 grams penalty, but you save around about 0 0.005 on your aerodynamics. And sure enough, we get the same effect. We get the same effect whereby at lower gradients, the TT wheel set gains you more speed compared to that climbing wheel set. Now the effect, the difference is extremely small because the aero difference is extremely small and the weight difference is extremely small compared to different riders, for example. The weight difference is only 500 grams. But there is a difference and it does cross over. And for a rider of, for example, 300 watts, it crosses over around about the 6% gradient mark so above 6%, it makes sense to have a climbing wheel set. Below 6%, it doesn't make sense. And the, really, the, the, the biggest factor there is the speed. At 300 watts, the rider going up 6% or below can generally go faster than 18 kph. So aero can, becomes a big factor very quickly. So your crossover depends on your power. A pro rider will have a crossover in terms of equipment higher up the scale because they'll be able to maintain, you know, above, let's say, 20 kph at a higher gradient. And so aero becomes more important to them um, at that point. What that really means in everyday terms is because that crossover is surprisingly high for equipment such as wheels, it's nearly always an advantage in regular rides to ride a more aerodynamic wheel set than a super light wheel set. Okay, so that's all you need to know about uh, equipment aero versus weight on gradients. Okay, guys, that's the end of the segment on the science behind riding hills and gradients. I hope that's useful. Just remember, not every stat will apply exactly to you because it has to be matched with your exact weight and your exact aero, your exact equipment. But all the principles there do apply. So have a think about that when you're riding, have a think about pacing strategy, have a think about variable pacing strategy, have a think about equipment, and uh, above all, enjoy your ride. Take care, guys.